2016. They came for the aging blood soldier a few minutes before midnight, bursting from the lobby of a housing project with a loaded 9mm handgun. The first bullet probably killed him, but six more shots followed anyway. And then the assailants scurried off into the shadows. Six brass shells lay in a halo at J. Quan Lawrence's feet. Another rested beside his head. A point-blank shot at an already dead man that would leave his face disfigured at an open casket funeral. In a South Bronx neighborhood where violence is hardly rare, the brutality of the ambush gave even the most hardened residents and detectives pause. But it meant even more to J. Quan's fellow bloods. It disabused them of the notion, however naive, that their gang's red flag of loyalty prevented one blood from killing another over a petty beef. The 14 killings that occurred amid the area's housing projects and rolling parks represented the most intransigent forms of urban violence at a time of historically low crime. Detectives called the 31-year-old's murder the darkest and most confusing killing on those streets in all of 2016. They believed it sprang from a fissure that from 2007 to 2017 has been reshaping gangs across the country, especially the Bloods. In 2016, of all the murders in the 40th precinct, this one was the most clearly linked to changing currents of crime that have led to deaths far from the Bronx. Gangs are not as top-down and regimented as they once were, or unified any longer by a vision of racial solidarity and rivalries with opposing gangs. Rather, the Bloods are fighting increasingly among themselves, sometimes to fill leadership vacuums, as older leaders are locked up through federal prosecutions. As a result, sets and subgroups of national gangs are splitting up, and they are losing influence over younger crews that are more loyal to their local housing projects. Now, the money-making, which is essential to gang life, is occasionally uniting bloods and crips, red and blue, bitter enemies for decades. This comes in the form of narcotics, car-stealing schemes, robberies, and etc. This makes gang life as chaotic and unpredictable as ever. There is no doubt that the idea of one blood nation is gone, said the former chief of the violent crime unit at the United States Attorney's Office in Manhattan. Detectives had told Jay Kwan's family that they were focusing on an up-and-coming Bloods leader and childhood friend of Jay Kwan's, one who gang members say was feuding with him over control of their set. The gang members, along with several friends and associates, spoke on the condition of anonymity out of concern for their safety. But the police hadn't publicly named a suspect. That sweltering August night, Jay Kwan had draped himself in the color of the Bloods, a throwback red and blue Detroit Pistons jersey, a red hat, red sweepants and red and white Air Jordan sneakers. His boxers were printed with dollar signs. On his right shoulder were three O's burned into the shape of a dog's paw, an anachronistic trademark of the East Coast Bloods. The verdict on the streets points this way. Jay Kwan, struggling to hold a job, stuck in a gang he no longer recognized, was leaning against a tide of change in the life of his set, the G-Shine Bloods. Jay Kwan had an idea that someone wanted to shoot him, so when he walked into the courtyard of the Millbrook housing project, he would often carry a Nike shoebox containing a 9mm. If the police came by to sniff cups for liquor, he would hand the shoebox to a friend. The friend would stash it in a trash can or under the bushes, where he could get it real quick, the friend said. On August 8, 2016, the Monday he was killed, friend said Jay Kwan wasn't paying as much attention as he had been to the threats lurking around him. He was born amid the crack boom and violence of the 1980s in the George Washington Carver houses in East Harlem. All around us, people were getting shot just for stepping on the wrong sneaker, said his mother. Still, his earliest days were relatively tranquil. Jay Kwan was a fat baby and slow to walk. Nicknamed Kwani, he thrived in school and developed a fondness for illustration, a talent inherited from his father. The child drew portraits of anyone patient enough to sit. But his father struggled with alcoholism and split from his mom's. She met another man and spent some nights away from Jay Kwan and his older sister. His mom's moved the family over the Harlem River to the Mill Brook houses in the Mott Haven neighborhood. She forbade her children to play in the courtyard and moved their beds away from the windows for fear of stray bullets. The new neighborhood brought new problems. Jay Kwan went to Morris High School. At the time, it was an institution afflicted by violence, shrunken staff size, and a paltry four-year graduation rate that hung around 30%. Jay Kwan began skipping classes before dropping out in the 11th grade. On many mornings, his mom's watched from her 11th floor window as her son bypassed his bus stop and instead walked to another tower in Millbrook. 
He moved in for a time with his father, who had since sobered up, but bristled at his strict rules and returned to Mill Brook, where he told a probation officer he had more freedom. That's when he got away from me, his mom said. He wasn't my Quanny no more, he was Q. J. Quan found a sense of purpose in the one institution around him that seemed to be thriving, the Bloods. By age 12, he was on the corner with men twice his age, waiting to rob someone, friends said. When he was around 17, his lawyer told a judge he got the dog's paw mark burned onto his shoulder. J. Quan had always wanted a brother. In the Bloods, he found he could have dozens, and on top of that, he could make enough money for small luxuries. Chinese dinners for girlfriends and new sneakers for his little sister. The love and loyalty aspect of our set was something that he respected more than anything, said a man in his mid-thirties whom Jay Kwan once recruited to the gang. Jay Kwan found a mentor in Robert Lockley, a thick-necked OG, original gangster of the gangster killer Bloods, one of several sets that joined forces under the banner of United Blood Nation, which was established in 1993 on Rikers Island to combat better organized Latino gangs. Robert the King Lockley was hot in New York City, so he set up shop in Newburgh. He died in prison in 2015, and we might do a story on him down the line. The death splintered the G-Shine set. Soon several men were vying for the crown, and the set devolved into disputes over who was snitching, who had power, and whether, at its core, G-Shine was a family or a business. The King's asleep, the Bloods recruit said, referring to Mr. Lockley's death. Everything changed. Anyway, GKB, or G-Shine, as J. Quan Set called itself, solved problems with violence. Everyone knew GKB were the shooters. They were individuals who had no fear, said Ron Barrett, a gang prevention specialist based in Albany. J. Quan was a good fit. He made up for his 5'8 stature with a big temper. Several friends spoke of his pulling a gun during fights. He would rob rival drug dealers, knowing they would probably not call the police. One night, he took what a friend described as $20,000 in robbery spoils to Sin City, a South Bronx strip club, then threw most of it in the air for the dancers. Friend said he also solicited clients online for prostitutes, a scheme that was growing more prevalent among bloods as their control of drug markets declined. Police officers knocked on the door of Jay Kwan's mother in 2010, looking for a gun. To avoid making a scene, Jay Kwan led them to a drawer where he had hidden a loaded 38 caliber Charter Arms revolver. A prior conviction on drug charges when he was 18 made possessing the gun a federal offense. Prosecutors said he told a detective he was in the Bloods and received money from gang soldiers, though Jay Kwan said he had the gun for protection only. A prosecutor said the authorities were not quite sure of Jay Kwan's role. A detective explained that Jay Kwan may have been out of the street game, out of the street life part of the gang, but nonetheless maybe he had moved up in the organization or was in some sort of retirement. Jay Kwan walked away from a halfway home in November 2011, then was returned to prison and released again. A short time later, he was accused of beating up a man whose son had given away a pit bull Jay Kwan had bred and asked the boy's family to watch. He told a probation officer that it was difficult readjusting to life outside because there were cocaine parties in his mother's apartment. When he returned to the streets, Jay Kwan was 29, past prime gang age, and imagined a steady, if duller, future raising the son he'd had eight years earlier with a girlfriend. He and the boy, known as Juju, played basketball outside when it was warm and video games inside when it was cold. After his fed time, he said enough is enough. He didn't want to be washing his clothes in a toilet bowl for the rest of his life. He had a son to raise. He got jobs folding hotel linens and stocking frozen food, and then a city job cleaning housing projects that paid less than $29,000 a year. Eager to escape the Millbrook houses, he borrowed money from his uncle and rented an apartment farther north for himself and his girlfriend. He kept the address a secret from everyone back in Mott Haven, including his own family. Then he started fighting with his girlfriend and missing days of work. He got into a fight with a tenant and lost his job. Jay Kwan's father often lent him money and once accompanied him to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. But the summer the year prior, Jay Kwan stopped answering his father's texts and calls. At the same time, G Shine began to split into warring factions. Jay Kwan had been counting on Mr. Lockley's return from prison to calm the big ego seeking the top job. One of them was a childhood friend of Jay Kwan's, a man with a reputation for greed and brutality. After Mr. Lockley died, the childhood friend started coming around the projects with bodyguards and flaunting his sleek black and white Audi. 
he became the set's leader and inspired widespread fear. I don't really like saying that cat's name one man said. I call him the Grim Reaper. The police have told Jay Kwan's family that the new leader was among those they were investigating after the murder. Through his brothers and mother, who were reached by phone and in person at the family home, the leader declined repeated interview requests from the Times. The leader was feuding with Jay Kwan on a few fronts. He and a brother had threatened Jay Kwan's friend, who had accused the brother of snitching in a federal case involving the sale of the drug PCP. The police believed Jay Kwan owed the new leader money for drugs. And Jay Kwan, friend said, resented him for his quick rise. The new G Shine leader started calling Jay Kwan. He'll call his phone and be like, yo, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that to you, to the point that Q was walking around with a gun said the friend who held the gun for him. In the evening, four to five hours before the murder, Jay Kwan got another call. The leader threatened to kill him, and Jay Kwan replied that he wasn't going anywhere. He walked his son and his son's mother to a cab on East 138th Street, passing a metal slide with an old bullet hole in the courtyard playground. Then he headed toward a Millbrook higher eyes, where his girlfriend was waiting with a warmed up plate of steak, rice and refried beans. He warned her not to share any spoilers about Power, the 50 Cent produced crime drama they were going to watch together. I'm walking to the building right now he said over the phone. Three men had sneaked into the building's lobby, taking advantage of its perpetually broken lock, and were waiting. There was no camera there or on the building's awning, one of the few public housing buildings in the 40th precinct without one. They killed him and ran. Kwani just couldn't get out of Millbrook his father said. So God took him out of Millbrook. After a storm of secondhand tips early on, the police investigation sputtered. Witnesses gave one set of answers about where they were when Jay Kwan got shot, GPS linked ankle bracelets and security footage gave another. Nobody tells us anything said Sergeant Michael J. Lapuzzo, the commander of the 40th Precinct's detective squad. It's a theme that echoed through nearly all of the precinct's murder investigations last year, and the Times stories about them. At Jay Kwan's funeral, 11 days after he was shot, rumors about the case flew around a chapel full of candy red do-rags and dresses. It was a bloods reunion, but also a reckoning of ruptures in the gang. Men hurled accusations of fake friends and spurned loyalties. A man in a red dashiki tried to speak. No more from Millbrook, no more, I can't do it, I can't do it he began before trailing off in whimpers and stumbling away from the lectern. Beside him, Jay Kwan's body was clothed in a red baseball jersey, along with a matching hat. In the Millbrook courtyard, there was no hiding the evidence of Jay Kwan's murder. A cousin and an ex-girlfriend had tried using lemon-scented ammonia to scrub off the bloodstains. But their kitchen sponges tore off in bits of yellow fuzz until they were too small to hold. With his blood set already fraying, the murder unspooled Jay Kwan's world entirely. Feeling paranoid and suspicious, his younger sister retreated into solitude before moving away. Worst of all was Juju. The 10-year-old boy had previously been a model of charm and composure, but he began acting out in school. Jay Kwan's mother had been in Florida when he was killed. On a grey Tuesday in October, she packed her things for the 27-hour bus ride back down south. This time it would be for good. Everything she couldn't stuff into two suitcases went into a heap of black trash bags spilled across the floor. The changes convulsing the G-Shine bloods in the South Bronx mirrored those affecting mainline national gangs in Newark, Chicago and Los Angeles. Over the past decade, the gangs splintered, leaving in their wake a number of proliferating subsets, many of them more aligned with particular blocks and business interests than with founding members growing old in federal prisons. In almost two dozen interviews, former Bloods, federal prosecutors, agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and local police detectives attributed the atomization to a variety of factors, none bigger than the aggressive conspiracy cases that regularly hit Bloods leaders with sentences described as football numbers. Years high enough to be football scores. But social media has also allowed up-and-comers to latch on to gang lore without ever meeting an older member, and the rigid hierarchy of street drug markets has waned. Several people have compared the Bloods to a franchise that has grown too large. Young men join because the brand name carries an automatic threat of serious violence against those who do not pay their debts. But as more and more franchises open, the founding ideal, brotherly love overcomes oppression and destruction, as the original acronym goes, fades away, and the Bloods become a business alliance more than a brotherhood. With leaders locked up, more Bloods are facing threats from within, as Jay Kwan did. There were once major consequences if you violated another red rag. 
Not so much anymore. Younger men sometimes even flip their affiliation between the Bloods and the Crips. And it is not uncommon for rival gangs to join forces. An FBI special agent in New Jersey, John Havens, said he arrested a group of Bloods who, along with two Crips, had been stealing cars. Mr. Haven said that when he asked one of the Bloods how he had made peace with his rivals in blue, the man answered, the only color stronger than blue or red is green. But this about wraps it up for this one, and as always stay low and thanks for watching.